I ran across something interesting called the master word. It's about a word that will work wonders for a person, regardless of his age or what he does with his days. Man, woman, or child, the master word will bring meaning and usefulness into his or her life, new clarity and self-respect and satisfaction into the passing days. This was written by the great physician, Sir William Osler. Though little, the master word looms large in meaning. It is the open sesame to every portal, the great equalizer, the philosopher's stone which transmutes all base metal of humanity into gold. The stupid, it will make bright, the bright, brilliant, and the brilliant, steady. To youth, it brings hope, to the middle-aged, confidence, to the aged, repose. Do you know what the master word is? Well, guess. I used it in my opening comments today. Did you recognize it? Well, the master word is work. I've talked about this before, but it's been said that we need reminding as much as we need educating. Human beings have the strangest and most perverse tendency to take the best parts of life for granted. In fact, the human being has the capacity to take anything, no matter how great it might be, for granted once he becomes used to it. The actor in front of the cameras, the captain of a great ocean liner, the man at the controls of a giant earth-moving machine, the writer, the painter, the mother, all seem to let the charm and excitement of their work fade after a while until it becomes as humdrum to them as candling eggs. William Osler and the other great men of the past and present knew the real value of work, not just its value to those who benefit from it, but its incalculably great value to the person performing it. These people seem to have the capacity for never taking their work for granted. Instead, they found it filled with interest and reward and became great because they did. I was talking not long ago with a top executive of one of our major oil companies. He had started his career working as a helper in a service station of the company whose nationwide sales he now directs. Why did he happen to see so much opportunity, adventure, and reward hidden in what the average person would consider to be the most menial and uninteresting work? It makes you wonder how how many young men in the same work today are looking beyond the gas tank they're filling or the windshield they're cleaning. And it makes you wonder, too, how a person can take his most precious possessions for granted until they become dull and dreary or lose their charm and become uninteresting. His loved ones, his home, his health, his abilities, and his work. What happened to the excitement of the first days when his wife, his home, and children, and his work were new in his life? Like the finest silver, these valuable things need regular polishing, and regardless of what it is we do with our days, they should be kept as bright as they were in the beginning. In this way, they can lead us to the new and even more interesting years ahead. Dr. Paul Shearer, speaking of Job's impatience to get immediate and direct answers to his question, said, Greatness and peace and happiness are simply not proper ends for any human soul to set for itself. They are the byproducts of a life that is held steady like a ship at sea to some true course worth sailing. Terrific, isn't it? Greatness and peace and happiness are not proper ends for any human soul to set for itself. They are the byproducts of a life that has held steady like a ship at sea to some true course worth sailing. In other words, if the course to which you're holding is right, everything else you want will come as byproducts. Some true course. How does a person find some true course worth sailing? I remember some time back a man came to me for advice on how he might become a popular sought-after platform speaker. He told me he enjoyed making speeches and wanted to make a career of it. I asked him what he wanted to say and drew a complete blank. It became clear that he was ready to speak on any subject the entertainment committee wanted him to speak on. It wasn't the subject. It was just that he wanted to make speeches. I told him that he'd never become a great and sought-after speaker until he had something he wanted very much to say, something inside of him that burned to get out, that he felt needed telling. Speakers become great because of what they want to say. Greatness follows the zeal of their subject. And it's the same with some other true course worth sailing. A person needs to find the course in which he can lose himself, dedicate himself, and then the greatness and the peace and the happiness will come to him naturally as the bee comes to the blooming flower or a child runs to its parents. People who find their lives filled with confusion and uncertainty, with boredom and unhappiness, need to find a meaningful vehicle for their lives, something in which they can lose themselves completely. It needn't be some great cause, although it can be. 
It can be found usually in our present work as a rule. It needs only be ferreted out. We need to know, we need to become, in the words of Dr. Maslow, self-actualizing. We need to become people who are steadily moving toward fulfillment, toward personal enrichment. Dr. J. Wallace Hamilton puts it pretty well when he asks and answers his own question. He writes, What then are the basic laws of happiness, and how do we learn them? I suppose the clearest law upon which there is fundamental agreement is that this inner music of the soul, which we've named happiness, is essentially and inevitably a byproduct, that it comes invariably by indirection. To pursue it, to pounce upon it, to go directly after it, is the surest way not to obtain it. People who make a mission of seeking happiness miss it, and people who talk loudly about the right to be happy seldom are. It's a byproduct, an agreeable thing added in the pursuit of something else. Way back in the days of sailing ships, sailors who ventured into Antarctic waters would occasionally see a strange and awe-inspiring sight. They'd see a great iceberg towering high out of the sea, moving against the wind. Now, since they depended upon the wind to drive their ships, they were keenly aware of its direction. And to see this great, shining, apparently inanimate monolith of ice moving mysteriously into the teeth of the wind was, to them, uncomfortably curious. It was not until much later that students of the sea learned of the great currents which, like titanic rivers, moved their mysterious ways through the body of the sea. These icebergs, some so huge that it took days to sail past them, had their roots, 90% of their bulk, caught in these great currents, and they moved majestically along their way regardless of the winds and tides on the surface. I like this story because to me it's a wonderful example of the way a person should live his life. A person should have his roots deep in a great moving current, a moving stream of conscious direction which will keep him on course, sailing steadily toward the destination he's chosen, regardless of the economic and social winds that blow first this way and then that on the surface. In such a life, there's no great hurry, no frantic running about, no doubt or confusion. Instead, each day he moves a little way along his course, steadily, unrelentingly. In one day, he doesn't seem to make much headway to the casual observer, but like the iceberg, if you come back in a week, you'll no longer find him at the exact latitude and longitude of a week ago. And in a year, he'll have covered a really marvelous distance. While most of those about him will still be moving in circles and by fits and starts. They'll go carrying past him one day like the hare sped by the turtle, if you don't mind my mixing my metaphors. But he plods steadily on, never looking back, thoroughly enjoying the trip. And above all, he has the wonderful calm knowledge of his destination and knows that each day finds him closing the distance that still separates him from it. Sometimes in his life, as in all lives, there are storms which tend to throw him off course and obstacles which for a time may delay him. But soon, he's right back on course again, moving ahead. This is the life of the strong, serene person, the person of wisdom, the person who knows that he cannot do or become everything in his lifetime, so calmly chooses that which he desires and which best fits his proclivity, pushing everything else from his mind, and begins his life's journey. The life of such a man or woman always demonstrates the almost unbelievable cumulative effect of time well spent. His steady, unswerving use of time seems to make it compound until, in a very few years, he's miles ahead of all but the few who live as he does. He's like that great iceberg. His roots are firmly held by the steady stream of his belief. Emerson taught, A point of education that I can never too much insist upon is this tenet that every individual man has a bias which he must obey, that it is only as he feels and obeys this that he rightly develops and attains his legitimate power in the world. There are few things more interesting than words. Here's one you can add to your vocabulary and to your way of life if you want to. The word is serendipity. S-E-R-E-N-D-I-P-I-T-Y. Serendipity. The meaning of serendipity, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is the faculty of making happy and unexpected discoveries by accident. And it means also the good things that almost always happen to a person following a bold course of action. Serendipitous things. The word was coined by the British author Horace Walpole, who based it on the title of an old fairy tale, The Three Princes of Serendip. The princes in the story were always making discoveries of things they were not in quest of. Let's say you're trying to invent something. Frequently, you will stumble onto something entirely different and wonderful that you had no idea of discovering. Well, that's what serendipity means. 
Now, the point I want to make is that you wouldn't have made the serendipitous discovery if you hadn't been looking for something else. I'll bet you've heard people say of someone, that's the luckiest guy in the world. But if you'll get to know the man, you'll usually find he's a busy, positive kind of individual who's always looking for new and interesting ways of doing things. Someone wants to define luck as something you find when preparedness meets opportunity. It just won't happen usually unless a person prepared for it. There are lots of interesting and pretty wonderful things that would be happening all the time to a lot more people if people weren't such stick in the muds as a rule. Take the person who hates his work, for example. There are millions of people, I suppose, who actually hate, loathe the work they're doing. But they stay with it because of some warped sense of security. Now, if they'd find out what it is they really love to do and prepare themselves for it, they could cut loose from what they're doing now. And the minute they do, this word serendipity comes into action. The good things that happen to a person following a bold, positive course of action. It's frequently found that a lot of boredom and frustration in our work comes from not knowing enough about it. You'd be surprised at the number of people who know only their own job, and that in a limited way, and who have no idea what's going on in the rest of their business. Frequently, a person in any given line of work can find interest, challenge, and just the job he's looking for, right in his own business or industry, if he's just taken the time to find out more about it. One of the greatest explorers who ever lived, Captain James Cook, began as an ordinary seaman. In four years, he had learned enough to become a master of his own ship, and later made the discoveries that, of course, made him famous. A happy, successful, serendipitous life, beginning as a common seaman. Another common seaman, named Joseph Conrad, studied and worked his way to become a ship's captain, and later wrote the wonderful stories of the sea that made him loved and famous. There isn't a single line of work where this hasn't happened. I just picked beginning as a common seaman as an example, because that's fairly a, a small beginning. But the same applies to anything else. Serendipity, it's quite a word, and it'll apply to whatever you do for a living.